church planning movement right here in North Carolina. And we are so thankful to partner with your church family to help every man, woman, and child in North Carolina hear the good news of Jesus Christ. Our vision is to plant new churches in all 100 counties over the next few years. Because of the financial partnership of churches like yours, we've helped to plant 30 brand new churches since 2017 with a 100% success rate. And in 2024, we're preparing to plant more new churches this year than ever before. However, this will only be possible through the power of God. There's a saying, little prayer, little power. Much prayer, much power. No prayer, no power. The only way to change the spiritual landscape of North Carolina is through the power of God. This is where we need your help. Our goal for 2024 is for 1,000 people to join our new Carolina Movement Prayer Team. This team will commit to pray for our state, our church plants, and our church planters. You'll receive regular updates on specific ways to pray for our planters and plants all throughout North Carolina. Will you help us tap into the great power of God through being one of those 1,000 people to join our prayer team? To join our prayer team, scan the QR code on the screen or go to carolinamovement.com slash prayer team. God is doing incredible things through your partnership with Carolina Movement. And with your prayer support, we know that the best is yet to come. Amen. And we're going to leave that QR code up. Go ahead and get your phone out if you want to scan that. I'm told it scan all the way from 75 feet away. We're hoping to have 1,000 people join this prayer team. And uh, we formed a competition. I, Surface Church has challenged us. They're going to try to have more prayer warriors than us. We're not going to get beat by Surface Church telling you okay so make sure you scan that and uh i am so so grateful did you hear 100 percent success rate of these new church plants that's incredible when 3,000 churches a year are closing to have these new embryonic churches doing well and it's because of your faithfulness thank you guys this is what we do we partner with these mission partners for local missions and i am so excited about what god's doing speaking of missions on the foreign mission front we will be commissioning our ghana mission team on Sunday, March 10th, if you want to put that down on your calendar, that's a special time. We invite them down front and we lay hands on them. We commission them. We literally send them out. And then two days later, they hop on a plane and they go to represent you. They are our missionaries. So we, we are so grateful for our foreign missionaries as well. And uh, you may remember in Christmas in July, we did a Christmas shoebox preparation for the mission uh, effort to take over. They are on a slow boat and they have just arrived or are about to and so when pastor bill and Stu arrive in march they're going to be there and they will be able to video those precious children opening those gifts and we're going to be able to take part in their joy and see it on their face how cool is that going to be all right so if you're waiting for an update they're getting there <laughs> might be a little bit after christmas but we are so fired up can't wait to see thank you again for your awesome generosity welcome back to part three of people of purpose. You have made it. You are the frozen chosen today. You have endured the cold, and we are here, and we're so excited about what God is doing as we dive deep into Ephesians 2. If you remember, or maybe you missed it, the first week we learned this big truth. You were created on purpose and for a purpose. You are not an accident. Okay, so just get that. That is a lie from the devil. You were created by the loving hand of God for a reason. And I am so glad that he did create you. And how perfect is it that today is also Sanctity of Life Sunday. This is a beautiful reminder. We know scripture teaches that every life has value. Every life has purpose. And you may remember when we launched this series a few weeks ago, we actually didn't start with Ephesians 2. We started with a foundational verse in Psalm 139 that says, For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. And I am so glad that he did create you with a purpose. Last week, we learned how to begin discovering that purpose. And we all went home with a little homework assignment. Do you remember? It was a challenge. I gave you a little fancy diagram and a powerful prayer. And I know you were all so diligent. You prayed that every day. And God spoke to you mightily during your quiet time. So what I thought would be fun today is to go around the room and everybody stand up and share your purpose. We'll start with you. No, we're not going to do that. We never do that. Never embarrass you like that. 
But I do hope you took the homework assignment seriously because you got another big one this week. And we're going to end a little differently this week as well. And I think you are going to love what the scriptures say to us today. All right, speaking of, look with me, Ephesians chapter 2. Let's keep diving in. For it is by what grace that you have been saved? Through faith. And this not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared a couple days ago for you to know. Way in advance for you to do. All right, now, we've read that a few weeks in this particular translation. Now I want us to look at the message translation because it is gold. Keep reading. Now God has us right where he wants us, with all the time in this world and the next to shower grace and kindness upon us in Christ Jesus. Saving is all his idea and all his work. All we do is trust him enough to let him do it. It's God's gift from start to finish. We don't play the major role. If we did, we'd probably go around bragging that we'd done the whole thing. Isn't that great? No, whether neither, we neither make nor save ourselves. God does both the making and the saving. He creates each of us by Christ, Jesus, and they join to him in the work that he does, the good work that he has gotten ready for us to do, work we had better be doing. I love that. Isn't that such a great translation? So now that we've been unpacking these verses... I want us to look at the context, because there's a key thing that, that happens here, and a lot of people miss it when they just study this kind of on, on a macro level. Ephesians chapter 2 is actually part of a larger letter that was written not to a person, not to an individual, but it was actually written to a group of people, to a church. All right, so this is written to a broad group of people. So when we think about being God's handiwork, we use the, the word poema, his master handiwork, when we think about that, as a church family, you have not only an individual purpose, but you have a collective purpose. You have a church, then there's the church. We come together to form the purpose, and we accomplish the mission that God has. And that's our first lesson for us today. You have an individual purpose, but you also have a collective purpose. We need to grasp this truth so that we understand where we fit in this. In verse 10, we learn that we're saved by grace, not by our works, but to go do good works. That it says God has prepared in advance for you to do. And though these good works are as unique as your fingerprint and how you're designed and created and shaped, today we are going to see that they also fit with a broader purpose for the church, where we come together to serve something much bigger than ourselves. That's why it's called the body of Christ. If you haven't heard that term, Jesus is the head. We are the body of Christ. Sometimes it's referred to as the bride of Christ, whereas Jesus is the bridegroom, and he is coming back to receive his bride. Jesus loves his church, and he is coming back for it. He wants to pursue it without spot, wrinkle, or blemish, washed clean by his incredible blood that he shed on the cross. Okay, So it's kind of hard to understand our individual purpose without first understanding how we fit with a larger purpose in the community. How do your good works align? With that, how, how do our good works interconnect with each other? All right, so let's start there. If someone were to come up to you and say, hey, you go to that church, or I pass your church all the time, what, what exactly is the church? How would you answer that? If someone were to come up to you and say, oh, yeah, I know that church, what they're probably referring to is the building, right? How many times do people give directions? They'll say, oh, yeah, you go past that red brick church. And then there's that white clapboard church downtown. You're going to go take a left there, and you're going to go right. That is not the church. That is a building. Nothing frustrates you more. Go, oh, it's such a pretty church. Are you looking at the people, or are you looking at a building? Because the architecture will come and go. That's just, that may be where a church meets. But we, collectively, those who have been redeemed by Jesus, we are his church. So there's two churches that are often spoken of, okay? There's the big C church, and there is the little C church. The Big C Church, capital C Church, refers to the church of God universally, worldwide. Anyone who believes and claims the name of Jesus is part of God's Big C Church. That's awesome, and that is the huge big picture. That is what he is coming back for. Everyone who has been a follower of Jesus on earth is part of the church of Jesus. But there's also a little C Church. 
And that's these local bodies all throughout the world. There's hundreds of thousands of these congregations, these little C churches that come together to form the big C church. And the big C church is where Jesus came and gave the greatest purpose statement the world has ever known. Our purpose, our mission was literally spelled out in his final words. They're found in Matthew, and he comes and he gives us the most incredible purpose, saying, your job of this, this is called the Great Commission, is to go give people from every tongue, every tribe, every race, every people, every nation on the planet the chance to hear and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That is our mission. And you can read Jesus' final words to us right here in Matthew 28. And he says this, then Jesus came to him and he said, some authority in heaven All, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. This is to Jesus. Therefore, sit and make this. There's that word, guys. We missed this. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Did you catch that? Go. Make disciples. Baptize them. We're going to be doing this exactly that on February 4th. We're going to be doing that two or three Sundays from now. We already had one young, amazing lady come up and talk, and she's fired up. She wants to make her profession of faith public. She's going to be baptized. What about you? Maybe you've been kind of wrestling with that. You've been sitting on the fence, or God's been tugging at your heart. You know, you, you're a believer in Christ, but you, you've never made that profession of faith public. You've never stepped out and said, you know what, I'm going to declare whose side I'm on. I am all in. Maybe that's, this is the perfect time for you. Would you come up and just talk to me right after church? Just go, hey, Pastor Matt, talk to me about baptism. What, what, what is that like? And I'll walk you through the steps, okay? This is a perfect time to do that. Then over in 1 Peter, the apostle Peter starts to connect you, the people of God, with the mission of God to define our collective purpose. Check it out with me. He says this, but you are a chosen people. You're a royal priesthood. A holy nation. Oh, man, did you catch those three descriptions? Do you feel like that? Because there's some days, man, that is some lofty description. A royal priesthood. A holy nation. A chosen people. God's special possession that you may what? Declare the praises of him who called you out of the darkness into his wonderful light. I love this next part. Once you weren't even a people. But now, you're the people of God. Once you hadn't received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Isn't that powerful? Our collective purpose as God's chosen people is to declare the goodness and the greatness of our God to a lost and hurting world. People, whether they admit it or not, people are dying to hear this good news, this this hope. We want to present the opportunities. We're not responsible for the results. That's up to the Holy Spirit. Our job is to go and to make disciples, to to tell the good news. This is why, as a local church, we are so passionate about planting these other churches, about local missions. This is why we sponsor so many churches all over North Carolina to help people hear and know the good news of Jesus. In fact, some of you may remember this. We we, uh, began our journey three years ago sponsoring Grace City Church with Pastor Daniel. Pastor Adam joined us a couple years ago, and this past year, Pastor Cedric over at Surface Church. Three incredible churches, 100% success ratio. They are still alive and well. In fact, Pastor Cedric, this is the church that challenged us this morning, by the way, to have more prayer warriors, okay? So I've invited him to come share with you next week. We'll see if our schedules sync up. He may be able to join us next Sunday. Y'all give him a hard time, okay? No, don't do that. Just uh, give him some love and and hug them, and and we we are so grateful. We need this, these teams because, guys, it's going to take all of us. They're going to reach a, 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 a sphere of influence that, that we just don't have. We're going to reach a sphere of influence that they don't have. And you're going to reach a, a sphere that I don't have. And likewise, and we'll be able to do that, right? We talked about that at Jordan Lake. Milo and I walk by. We're, who's in your path? I love the story. I hear stories this week. Several of you have come up and shared. You wouldn't believe the, the random stories of somebody just coming across my path. We start talking. Next thing I know, we're talking about Jesus. Oh, and pastor, they're coming next week. They want to they meet you. And I'm like, wow, this is incredible. That's it. That's what you, it's not rocket surgery. It's opening our mouth and being willing to speak of the goodness and greatness of our God. 
All right, so how does that look like for you? And what about your unique purpose and how this comes together? See, even though we are separate individuals, we all serve one Lord Jesus. And we serve him together to advance his kingdom, his mission, not ours. 1 Corinthians 12 puts it like this. Read it with me. It says, just as a body, the one has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit so as to form one body. Whether Jew or Gentile, slave, free, we were all given the one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but many. I think I've got a, I have a shirt over here. I was going to show the little, is there a green thing on the ground maybe? This is something so cool. Back in the, the early 90s, I owned the college ministry at a church in Birmingham, Alabama. God bless America, roll tie. And in Alabama, I was directing college ministry, and this was our theme verse from Corinthians. And it says, although you are many parts, you form one body in Christ. I still have this shirt, and I was going to wear it. <laughs> but it shrunk, right? It's so weird. I don't understand how shirts shrink just sitting on a shelf for 20 years like that. But it did. And this, this is where I found my wife. We fell in love at this church. This church holds a special place in my heart. But this is a verse that is so dear to me and to scriptures. You see the ear and the nose, and we all serve different. But how weird would our church look if every one of us were a giant nose? Or we all were left feet? Or we were all armpits? Or whatever. You pick, you pick the part, right? How weird would that be? We can't each do every function, but each one of us has a specific function. Right? Think, think about the parts of your body. Everyone has a collective purpose. They all come together to keep you alive. They each have a unique purpose to come together and sustain you. Your lungs have a different purpose than your eyes. And your eyes have a totally different purpose than your hands. And your hands are different than your stomach. And you see where this goes. But if any one of them went on strike and said, I'm not doing it. Imagine if your lungs said this morning, you know what, we're not breathing. I'm done. I'm out. I'm tired. I'm just going to lay in bed. It's cold. I get it. Even I think it's cold. But I know, right? <laughs> it's miraculous. You know how you know it's cold, by the way? Because I'm only down to two fans on me right now instead of three. It's a true story. Each of our body parts serve a specific purpose. We need every one of them, but they're all coming together to fulfill the collective vision that God has for our body. This is why we call the service people of a purpose and not person of purpose. Did you catch that? The series is different. It's not directed to us individually. And that's our next truth. Our individual purpose is interconnected with the collective purpose of the church. Does that make sense? Have we got any Star Trek fans here? When you hear the word collective, what do you think of? Mm-hmm. Right? The reason I didn't put that there is because the Borg is bad. I didn't want to put that in your mind, but I can't get away from it. Every time I read this, I think, assimilate. The Borg, right? That kind of thing. I'm a big Star Wars guy, but I got to get some Star Trek people some props. The collective purpose of the church. Remember, it is the body of Christ. The church is the bride of Christ. He's coming back for it. Jesus loves his church. And he's made us interconnected. In fact, if you keep reading in Ephesians 4, this is what you actually see spelled out in verse 16. It says, from him, the whole body, joined and held together by everything supporting ligament, grows and it builds itself up in love as each part does its work. It's a beautiful picture. Y'all remember laminin the first week? Louis Giglio talked about laminin, the cell adhesion molecule and how powerful that was, the shape of a cross. Everything in him holds together. It is incredible. What a powerful, beautiful picture of an interconnected, purpose-filled group of people. Your purpose is defined. Even my purpose is defined. You know, my job description, if you keep reading in Ephesians 4, verse 11, it says this, and he himself, Jesus, gave some to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, some pastors, some teachers. Why? To equip the saints for the work of the ministry, to build up the body of Christ. There's those words, to build up, to edify the body of Christ. There it is, right there, verse 12, to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. My role isn't to be a one-man band Y'all see those one-man monkey band where they got like, the cymbals and they're just <laughs> clapping and they got the drum and they're just working themselves to a frenzy? That's not it. My job is not to score all the touchdowns, be in the spotlight. My job is to equip you. I want to hand the football off to you and watch you score the touchdown. To let you taste the thrill of victory. Nothing thrills a pastor more 
than to see other people leading people to faith in Christ, to be sharing the gospel with family and friends and inviting them to, to hear about Jesus and coming. It is that when you're using your gifts and your shape and your talents to advance the kingdom, that's what fires me up. That is what is exciting when each part of the body is performing its unique function in unity with other parts of the body. Man, the church is unstoppable. And I might add, the kingdom of darkness flees. The kingdom of darkness trembles when the church operates in unity, in its shape, in its giftedness. But the opposite is just as true. When the church is dysfunctional, or when members of the bride of Christ have their own agenda and their own mission, they just want to make up their own purpose, and they are disconnected from the body, it's pretty obvious what happens. Just imagine if your lung says, you know what, I'm not going to breathe oxygen today. In fact, I'm leaving. I don't want to be connected to the heart. You would die. It would shrivel up. You, your lungs are specifically designed by God to perform that specific function. What if it didn't? Your lungs would be frustrated. The body would be frustrated. It would be deprived of oxygen. You see the symbolism here. And both would shrivel and fail. And they would fail to live up to their God-given purpose. That's why you see that in so many churches where the devil has crept in and he's got them yin yin and talking about uh, some of the biggest fights I've ever heard or should we buy a dumpster out back or four large garbage cans. And you see churches split over something so silly. They weren't focused on the mission, I can tell you that. If you got time to yin yin about stuff like that, heaven help us. The church functions beautifully when we are in unity. Look what Romans 12 tells us. It says this. It says, now, as we have many parts in one body, and all the parts do not have the same function, in the same way, we who are many are one body in Christ and individually members of each other, one another. Did you hear how much time? These are different scriptures from all over the New Testament talking about your importance, your importance, your importance. But we all come together, and we move the ball down the field together. Way back in 1949... There was a show that debuted on TV. I asked a few of you as you came in this morning if you recognize this person, all right? If you do, shout out his name if you know who this is. Okay. What I discovered was if you were under the age of 40, you do not know who this is. And that's cool. There's nothing wrong with that. That shows you a cultural, generational kind of thing that's happening here. Anyone remember the name of the horse that he rode? Silver, right? And his, and his partner? Tonto. Right, right. Okay. This show was a huge hit, and it went on for years. 1949, I think for almost another decade, this show ran. And his name was The Lone Ranger. I, I got a problem with this guy. I got a beef with The Lone Ranger. He has infected the church. Far too many Christians, especially Western Christianity, think that they can be Lone Rangers for Jesus. Just one problem with that. There are no lone rangers in scripture. You were not created to be an island. You will not last in this world by yourself. It is dog eat dog out. There's no lone rangers. In, and now maybe somebody's been hurt by the church. I get that. Maybe they don't think church is important to kingdom living. But a lot of times it's the people are so self-focused that they don't see any value being tied to a larger body worshiping something larger than themselves. I saw a perfect meme going around. It's actually almost hilarious in its, in its graphic, uh, what, what it's saying here. But I want you to look at this meme. If I'm a Christian, but I don't need the church was a photo, here you go. <clears throat> and I want you to let that sink in. And I showed it to somebody this morning. They said, do you think they'll understand? I said, all right, you know what? Zoom in and let's, let's identify this. Here's the church. Here's you out all by yourself. And here's Satan <laughs> tracking you down. What a great illustration. And that's how I felt. When I'd go through those seasons before ministry where I was, yeah, church was kind of optional and I didn't really need anybody. And ah, it's so cold. I don't want to get out. We were never intended to be independent Christians. Jesus has an interdependent community called the Bride of Christ that he is coming back for. If you ever want to fulfill your individual purpose, we have to guard against this Lone Ranger spirit that says, I don't need anyone. 
We see this a lot. Not just in our country, but we see this in, in prosperous countries. I can do this on my own. To say I don't need anyone, it, it kind of smacks of arrogance, does it not? To say I don't, I don't need anything. You know, well, you may not think you need anyone, but let me ask you a question. What about the people who need you? Did you ever think of that? The I don't need anyone is exclusively focused on me. All right, let's say you don't, but what about the people who desperately need your gifts, your hug, your smile, your servant's heart, your embrace, your love? Take your eyes off yourself. What about the others who, who need it? It is so easy to become self-focused. Man, I get it. But Romans 12 just reminded us, seeking to fulfill our purpose disconnected, disconnected from the body that he's coming back with, that is prideful. We need each other. Man, I don't know about you, but I am so glad for this body of believers. When the days get darker, and they are getting darker. By the way, this is an election year coming up. Can I just say something ahead of time? It is going to get weird with a capital W. It is going to get so bizarre. If you remember 2020, I went... This is not going to be a place for political commentary every Sunday. I'm going to try to, my best to keep this out of the ditches and focus on Jesus during this time, okay? If you want that, you can get that, turn on the news or whatever, but it is going to get weird. We need to be classy, and we need to represent Christ in all of our communication, all of our Facebook tweets, all of our X and whatever, hemojibis out there and the instagram face and stuff. That stuff represents you, which represents Jesus, Y'all keep that in mind. Just a little public service announcement. I just want to put that out there. We are connected to each other. Therefore, my testimony affects your testimony. Check out what Romans 12 goes on to say. It says, we have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it's serving, then serve. If it's teaching, then teach. If it's to encourage, then give encouragement. If it's giving, then give generously. If it's to lead, do it diligently. If it's to show mercy, do it cheerfully. All right, so, so what about these spiritual gifts? I mean, wouldn't it be great if there was a list of these somewhere? Good news, church. <laughs> there is, right? There's all kinds of great passages about this. And while this is not a message on spiritual gifts, perhaps we could break that down and walk through each one. Every believer has at least one of these. Do you know what yours is? If not, you came on the right day. This is going to be one of the best homework assignments that you've ever had. See, the truth is, God is not trying to hide your purpose or your giftedness. God is not some aloof genie in the sky going, I know your purpose, but I'm not going to tell you. He wants you to discover it. He wants you to walk in your unique design. Okay, so if you've ever, never really uh, prayed about or explored it, this is going to be awesome, okay? You are not here by accident, and that's your last truth today. We often discover our purpose within the body of Christ. The body of Christ is a great first place to fulfill your purpose. So here's what we're going to do. In just a minute, I'm going to send everyone home with a spiritual gift inventory, a test, if you will, a survey. And when you hear the word test, I know a lot of people hate tests. It ain't that kind of test. There's no grade on it. You don't have to turn it in. Don't have to give it to a mean old principle. This is for you to take home and for you to pray about and go through. And it is fun. It's, it's not a bad thing. I think it's a hundred something one line questions. And you get to put down your answer in grade. Be honest. Be honest with yourself because this will help steer you towards some of the temperaments and the shape that God has given you. And I want you to prayerfully pray about God, where do you want me to serve? In fact, uh, Pastor Jason even has a link on our website of where can I serve. Maybe you want to go there and check it out if you're not sure. There's some simple places. If you don't have to have any training, maybe you just need to get out and do something. The family of God provides an awesome opportunity for us to begin to serve, okay? So I'm going to call up my volunteers. Let me, I'm going to have one of these if I can hold this up. You guys stand right here, and I'm going to, I'm going to have uh, two of you. Let's see. Milo, you want the lobby? Or you want to? Okay. Milo, you can go to the lobby. You stay there. And then, Mayor, Mayor, we're going to have you on this side after we dismiss. Marky Mark, we're going to have you on this side. And here is your assignment, okay? We're going to pray a prayer in just a minute, but you have some next steps. The first thing I want you to do is start serving somewhere together on mission. No longer be content to just sit. None of us were saved to sit. We were saved to serve. Nowhere in the New Testament do you see a, a, a Christian who is content 
to just sit and soak? Where is your mission? What does God have you to do? The second thing I want you to do is I want you to take this survey. If you haven't already, you can get it online. And if you're watching online, we'll try to post the link to this that you can get it. There's several versions of this. This is just one that was put out by Lifeway. And again, this is not some written in stone thing. This is to get you thinking and praying, which leads you to your last next step. I want you to start asking God, where can you make the biggest impact for him? Okay, as the days grow more serious and the world gets darker and they're looking for your light, where do you fit in? What is your mission, okay? So this is gonna be our prayer together. It comes from 2 Thessalonians. And what we're gonna do is I'm going to ask us all to stand, and I'm going to have this be our benediction, okay? So you can stand with me, and we're going to pray that God will empower us to live out our purpose together. After this, make sure you, I, I should have enough for just about every family, maybe one for every person. Uh, if we run out, we'll, we'll try to get more, and we'll have some for next week. Don't forget, Baptism Day is next uh, Sunday the 4th, and if uh, you want to talk about that, just see me right after church, okay? All right, here's our benediction and our prayer as we go. With this in mind... We constantly pray for you that our God may make you worthy of his calling and that by his power, he may bring to fruition your every desire for goodness and your every deed prompted by faith. Amen and amen. God bless you guys. I love you. I hope you have an awesome week. Don't forget to grab one of these surveys and I will see you next week.